Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Braverman. And I'm Ellen Selm. Welcome to our podcast, Stories from the Earth. Where we explore mankind's relationship and connection with the natural world. Today, we are going to be talking with Ellen's sister, Pat. And we're super yes. excited about that. <laughs> yeah, let me do a little uh, big sister bragging for a moment. <clears throat> Uh, Kat comes from the same background as myself, which fostered a lot of our love for the outdoors, um, care and stewardship for the planet. But then she kind of took that and ran with it to pursue an undergrad in biology with a concentration in botany and a master's of science in natural resources and GIS mapping technology, that is geographic information systems, and um, acted as a research assistant in the urban ecology lab where she studied people's perception of the adaptations to climate change. She's worked a variety of jobs in conservation related avenues across multiple states in both private and nonprofit sectors. Her most recent employment is with a large national nonprofit conservation organization which took her all the way out to California, where she is currently overseeing some of their land management, monitoring its plant and animal life, raising money for designing and overseeing the installment of a public access park and educational hub in some conservation areas to increase community connection and engagement with the land around them, as well as helping found an immediate local climate action group called Conejo Climate Coalition, inspired by Greta Thunberg's climate actions and she's vice chair of her local climate reality project chapter. Additionally, due to California's ever-growing issues of homelessness, some of her work and volunteer efforts also intersect with this cause um, because issues of justice on our planet do tend to intertwine on a lot of platforms. All in all, I can't say she doesn't keep busy. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, um, we're going to be having a chat with uh, Kat today about how she got into the work she does, what motivates her, and more. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's really great to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What a great intro. <laughs> yep, little mini novelette there. <laughs> so we're going to just jump right into the, the questions today. Uh, can you share any early life story with us about experiences that really inspired your connection to the natural world and perhaps started you down this path to the field you are in today. Sure, I'd love to. Um, can I do some big sister bragging about Ellen or little <laughs> sister bragging? <laughs> Please, I mean, do. I think Please do. She, you know, in a lot of ways, she really uh, raised me and our other sister in in certain areas of our lives because she read to us bedtime stories. She babysat us during the days. You know, she um, she really f helped foster my love of nature by playing outside. You know, it was just free open play, not at a playground, but just in nature, you know, able to do whatever you want, imagine whoever you want to be. And I think that that kind of imagination and that kind of play is really lacking in our world. And there's a lot of research out there to show that um, free play in nature is a lot more beneficial for, for kids' minds and imagination and, and love of nature than it is for a more confined type of outdoor play, like in a, in a jungle gym. Um, so I, I think having that background and having Ellen as a sister, you know, building teepees and playing wolves and like, you know, just make believe outside. Bushwhacking um, through the kudzu jungle. <laughs> <laughs> playing in non-native invasive species our whole lives. Uh, but I think that like my, my real connection with nature actually happened in undergrad um, when I took my first botany class and they made us um, do herbarium collections and, and write um, about each species that we were collecting. Like, habitat, morphology, um, phenology, like all the ology words, <laughs> everything about these individual species. And they were weeds, like chickweed and stuff that I'd seen on the side of the road every day, but I never stopped to notice and like actually collect thoughts on it and, and understand its behavior and what it's doing and why it lives where it does. And it, it made me like learn them as individuals instead of just as something you see, you know, it's, it's something that you um, 
you get to know their names, you know, like their likes and dislikes. It's like a friendship, you know? So I started to form the that like bond with plants really when I was sort of forced to by school. <laughs> so that started my love affair with science, I think. Yeah, and then um, it kind of branched out quite a bit from undergrad doing field work with a lot of plants and things. And then when you decided to go um, back to grad school, you did some pretty interesting experiment for your thesis work, um, findings of which were published in scientific journals, Loss One and Frontiers. Um, can you share with the audience what that project was and why did you decide to start doing that? Like, what was your biggest takeaway from that? Hmm. I think there's a huge leap from that to graduate school because I, I started down the path of botany and I did a lot of botany jobs and traveled around the country doing botany jobs because I thought that's what I wanted to do was be, um, you know, a botany professor or something and, and go into that field. And I, you know, through the course of learning what I want and what I care about, I realized that the intersection of people and nature is really where I thrive and what I want to focus on for a lot of different reasons. And so I decided to go to school in an urban ecology lab, which is at the time there was only a handful of them in the in the um, US because it's a really sort of new field of study. Um, and it's, it's all about the intersection of humans and nature. Um, and so my research was focused on um, adaptations to climate change, which when we think about that, it's usually like large infrastructure projects, right? Like setting back coastal cities and, um, you know, infrastructure that's going to be able to withstand the impacts of climate change. But what we miss a lot of the time is how people actually address climate change is on an individual basis. So it's mm -hmm. in the, the social connections you have, the financial capital that you have to be able to withstand a shock, like a flood or a fire. Or, and so I wanted to address um, how we can actually measure that because there weren't any real substantial tools at the time to measure how people can adapt individually. Um, and then another sort of sidebar project that came out of this data set was um, looking at people's perceptions of their own climate change knowledge. It's not what I set out to actually study, but we ended up finding some interesting findings that we published on, which is that women, when they have higher education, tend to second guess their climate um, knowledge more than men. And it sort of bore out in the data that um, it's it's kind of the Dunning-Kruger effect. I don't know if you either of you have heard of that, but it's like the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And so people who, who are of higher intelligence usually second guess their intelligence more than people of lower intelligence. <laughs> so that's kind of shown that like women um, second guess themselves more when, especially when they're higher educated. So they they think that they don't know what they actually know. And it's, it's also kind of talks about, um, what's the word for it? Um, um, imposter syndrome that I think a lot of women, especially women in higher education experience. So I, I didn't set out to research that, but it just sort of came out of what I'd collected going door to door, taking these surveys. Um, so yeah, it seems like a far cry from what I did back in undergrad with botany, but you know, people's perceptions of nature and their own education and how they're going to adapt to climate. I mean, I, I feel like it's all related because it's all about how you're interacting with nature and how you're going to survive threats, you know. And you talked to a pretty wide swath of people, didn't you? I mean, like in terms of um, race, gender, economic status, et cetera, to try mm -hmm. to like get a, a, a broad pooling. That's yeah, we got a representative sample of all of Raleigh. So it was going into people's homes, 200 people's homes of, of all different backgrounds, races, religions, economic statuses. It was so fascinating, <laughs> actually. It was one of the coolest things I've ever done. Can you clarify a little bit how, sorry. how you, you did there? Can you give an example of like how someone's education sort of wouldn't match up with what they thought? I... Mm -hmm. Um, that is a good question. So, so, uh, can you imagine a world where someone has a belief system and, 
you know, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but just imagine like a very conservative Republican person. <laughs> they have a certain worldview and you try to um, inform them, you know, give them information that may alter that worldview, but yet they double down. Um, it's because they're protecting their own beliefs. Um, and so that that's like one scenario where, where Dunning-Kruger is, is evident. Um, Actually, maybe that's a bad explanation. You should probably take this part out. <laughs> um, but it's it's like the the more you know, the less you think you know. Um, and so I think that um, I don't think I'm doing a good job of explaining. Okay, I guess, I guess let's the, circle back. I guess the question is like how like when you were talk when you were interviewing the people mm -hmm. from I guess that you were asking them questions, right? Mm -hmm. How did you determine from the questions that you asked them that their what they might know with their education oh, level I got you. didn't match yeah, up yeah. with what they were right, thinking, right. saying? A lot of the time, these kind of studies will will actually gauge how much people know by asking. Um, so they'll ask like a question about weather patterns, and they'll be like, "Do you know the difference between a tornado warning and a tornado?" Mm -hmm what's the other word for it um or a flat uh, uh you know there's there's multiple levels of right, like yeah. warning right so or do you know what causes the greenhouse gas effect do you know that methane is more potent greenhouse gas than co2 so you'll ask like specific questions to get at someone's level of knowledge mine asked about their perceptions of knowledge so i said how much you know on a scale of one to five do you know about climate change and the the women who are higher educated, so like master's degrees, PhDs, okay. were the ones saying that they ranked the lowest. So they're like, oh. I don't actually know that much about climate change. When in reality, they probably do, <laughs> but their male counterparts of the same educational level would claim that they knew more. So it's this kind of like swagger, you know? <laughs> it's, so it's really indicative of the other thing we call is, it, call it is stereotype threat. And so a lot of women and minorities, it's been proven out in the data that when they're in higher education scenarios, they feel more, um, they feel like they know less and they feel like they know less than their white male counterparts. And it's, it's called in the literature stereotype threat. And I think that kind of contributes to the imposter syndrome feeling of like, I'm, you know, I'm not cut out for this. I don't know as much as the next guy. You know, it's it's something I definitely struggle with. So it's kind of interesting that I just happened to accidentally research something that I face every day of my life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely struggle with it myself, especially doing this podcast and and everything else. And like, also like in my knowledge of herbalism, I'm like, I don't really know anything. And then you encounter somebody who doesn't know what chickweed is. And I'm like, well, I know what that is. So I know something. Mm -hmm. uh, it could, it's such it a could, hurdle to trust your own knowledge. I don't know what it is. And it's frustrating. But it, I think you still doing this, even though you feel like that, is a testament to like how you can overcome that. I think that's great. Yes. Uh, I think that is one of the ways to overcome that is to, is to just proceed be like well mm -hmm. if i don't know something actually then i can learn about it and this whole thing is a learning process anyway like i don't know everything about doing a podcast but or i don't know everything about herbalism so it's also like accepting that you, what you know and then also what you don't know i guess knowing both pieces mm -hmm. I think it almost the situation sort of can force a bit of a humility, not in every personality, but for a lot of people, because, you know, like you had said, Kat, the more the people, the more they knew, the more they realized they didn't know. like the more you're open to learning, the more you realize there's always going to be more to learn. And if you're more pigeonholed in your thinking, um, it leaves more room for the ego to come front and center instead of, you know, humility to the, to the broader knowledge of the world, you know? Yeah. That's such a good point. I mean, that's Dunning-Kruger to a T is like the 
the more educated you become, the more you realize, whoa, there's so many people that know way more than I do about X, Y, and Z. You know, I feel that way about plants, especially in California, where I'm like, I'm not even going to try because I know enough to know that I don't know anything. <laughs> so it's like a balancing act of like, yeah, you should own up to when you don't know something, but you should also like recognize that you do have an expertise and that people do want to hear from you. It's tough. It's tough being it a a lady and a scientist in that way. Yes, or even just, I think some of this comes from just the women in society, just our, mm -hmm. you know, how we still sort of struggle with that, with that. So when I was working at a large, big box, uh, natural food chain, natural food store chain, and I was working in their like supplement department, it was interesting because in all of my other jobs, like I worked a cashier, I worked front desk hotel, people, customers would automatically assume that you have a very low education level. You get treated like that. But mm -hmm. once I went into the supplement department, I suddenly got like a PhD. <laughs> it was crazy. People were like, you know everything, you're the expert. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> but I'm the same person. Like, I mean, I, and I'm like, hey, I'm not a doctor, guys. You know, like, so I was, was, I would try to help them out, give them my best knowledge. And then if they needed to, to be redirected to someone who had more knowledge, do that. And then when I left that job and went back to a more cashier job, it was really hard. It was really hard and shocking to go back to a level where people thought you were an idiot. Mm. And again, I am the same person with the same I, you know, level of intelligence. That's also a factor in how you feel about what you know and mm -hmm. how other people perceives perceived you. Perceived yeah. you. And yeah. right now I know because of having gone through that, I know that none of that is actually me. I'm, I'm me and I am of this intelligence level. But I think that if somebody else maybe hadn't gone through those job changes with sort of that level of um, aha moment or uh, clarity about what was going on, I think they would think, hey, I'm dumb or, you know, they yeah. would have this other idea about themselves and that might also factor into this um imposter syndrome mm -hmm. well that yeah. um, subject's kind of a good segue into your next question the next here. question okay cool so for anyone interested in and considering pursuing similar study and career in um biology conservation climate resilient work etc what would be some of your main words of advice? Is there any, is there anything you wish that you had known better back then in your early years of school or career that you know now? Um, I think that one thing that I did right, and I can't say that too often, but one thing I did right was not rushing to higher education and like actually taking my time to travel and take different unique interesting jobs that try to inform what I thought I wanted to do um, and then learning about myself and what because I you know as much as higher education I really am a proponent of it and I have obviously contributed lots of money and time towards it I think um, there's a lot of things you don't learn and one thing you don't learn is what a job actually is like in any field. I mean, the only thing you learn about is what it's like to be a professor, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know like what botany work was like. I didn't know what the problems were that needed to be solved. I didn't know, you know, anything about what I'd be doing for the rest of my life. Um, so I'm really glad that I did that. That being said, one problem I think in the industry of conservation and biology and just natural sciences in general is that there's no money and there's no support. And so mm -hmm. the type of people you can attract are people who have the means to be able to 
do an AmeriCorps or a Peace Corps or, you know, all those other little internships that sometimes you even have to pay for. Like there's some research assistantships that you have to pay to do, which is just totally wow. unfair. And that's why, you know, this field is full of affluent white people who are all complaining how there's not enough diversity. Well, that's the problem is because <laughs> you can't pay anyone to do work. You just have to rely on their passion for it. And that's just really not right. It's something that I've, I got, got off on a tangent there, but I no, feel I fortunate. Mean, it it needs to be to said, that. you know, I mean, there's a lot of scientific angles and, you know, potential advancements we could be making if our culture was just, mm focusing its money and efforts in those directions more than it is, you know, it's like, why is, why is any of that um, an afterthought in a sense, you know? Yeah. Just really bizarre. showing our values and what we fund and what we pay for in this yeah. country. I found out that I was listening to another podcast. They had a, their recent guest said that the fossil fuel industry is, supplemented, I'm, I'm missing the word, subsidized a lot mm -hmm. yep. by the government. And then also there's just a lot of that money in Washington mm -hmm. where like mm -hmm. if the government was subsidizing or if there was more money in, in the conservation area or, you know, researching climate change and how to address it, mm -hmm. we would be in a better place. Yeah, just, you're, you're well, so case right. Point, you know, Kat, I know that um, the work you were doing uh, before you went back to grad school um, was in more private sector contract work. And a lot of it was for natural uh, resources like what, oil, coal, et cetera, et cetera. So you were being employed as a botanist and in a conservation capacity, but your paycheck was ironically being cut by the mm -hmm. companies that probably, you know, could have cared less. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's just such a strange juxtaposition. Um, I remember yeah. you telling me that, that you sometimes would go out in the field looking for these, you know, at risk plants, just hoping you would find them just for the sake that if you, wasn't it that if you, you were looking for plants, and if they were of a certain uh, protected status, you would have to mark the area as no drilling allowed or whatever. And you were just like <laughs> cross your fingers, hoping you would yeah. find something. And like, it just sucks that anybody who goes to school for the passion of conservation would end up in a situation where just to pay the rent, mm -hmm. you know, just to have a job in their field, they're put into mm -hmm. that sort of juxtaposition. Yeah. I mean, that that's, it, it's seldom talked about in, in our field, I feel like, but it it's the main source of revenue is things like mitigation. So like an oil and gas company will drill and then they'll have some certain criteria that they have to meet to restore, or you'll alter a stream channel. This is big in North Carolina, stream restoration. Most of my friends get paid just doing mitigation for stream alterations. And so it's a perverse incentive in our society, in our economy, that people like me are paid mostly from from detrimental industries to to the causes we believe in. You know, it's it's a big problem in my opinion, and I'm, I feel incredibly fortunate that I worked to find a place where I can be paid to actually do good work and not have to sell my soul like that because it's crushing and it's really sad. And it's unfortunately the way that you actually make good money <laughs> is by doing mitigation work like that. So yeah, really happy I don't work for oil and gas anymore. Now I'm working to, to take them down. <laughs> hey. Definitely glad I don't work for them anymore. So what's um, what's one or two of the, the craziest or most amazing experiences you've had when you were out doing field work though, since you've worked in such a variety of places around the country? Mm. Oh man, I could tell so many stories. Um, can I just rattle off a few? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's so many. Um, well, I, two years ago, I got to see one of the world's last Monterey pine stands, which was really sad and beautiful and amazing. That's kind of how you can encapsulate, I think, being a biologist in the 21st century is, it's the 21st century, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> 
<laughs> is you know you get to see you get to see the last of things, which is oh, really yeah. sad to say, but it's but it's also beautiful because you can you can learn about them and then learn what you can do to to help and protect those places. Um, so I got to hold a giant hellbender in North Carolina and do a workup on wow. one, which was the highlight of my freaking life. And then I got to do a workup on a con a California condor where I held Whoa. this this baby in my lap and drew blood and did the whole nine yards and it was so cool and I got to keep the tag I forget which number he is but um and then one time I, me and my partner just went to um to Death Valley and the whole time I was just reminded of what what I love about the west like how wild and beautiful and crazy and quiet it is I mean it's so quiet that you can hear a pin drop from a mile away you can see the milky way at night you can hear coyotes in the distance like it's just anyway i'm just kind of like rambling now but when i used to work in nevada we'd sleep outside like we didn't have tents or anything we'd just sleep on our sleeping bags and there was oh, the wow. first time i ever saw the milky way i woke up like in the middle of the night to use the bathroom opened my eyes and it was just right there in front of me and i was like what and i just tears started streaming down my face because i'd never being from the East Coast, uh -huh. I've never seen anything like that. You can see it so. up on my hill sometimes in the middle of summer. <laughs> pretty, pretty good uh, no light zone out here. I, I grew up just on the opposite side of town from where Ellen is. And I just remember there, it was also in a place where there weren't a lot of lights. And at night when the moon was full, it would just shine right through my bedroom window and you could literally <laughs> read by it. So I, I understand what you're saying. And I, and I, right now I live in town and there's this, we're right next to a parking, like a community center, but it has this humongous street light that shines all night in the parking lot. So, you know, you can't see any oh. stuff. <laughs> but That's hopefully so where we're hopefully where we're moving because um, we're where we're getting a house and it, it the back of the house butts up to like a, a cow field. So I hope that That's an upgrade, to... I think. <laughs> I think so. I definitely think so. There's this huge big oak tree which is really cool and I'm really excited about that. But that's my. I just had that firsthand experience of the place where, where I lived before, where I live now. There's no um, public parks. There's no. So we're right by the highway, and then an ag field, and I I never really like experienced that lack of access to nature before in my life. You know, I mean, I've lived mm -hmm. in cities, but like this just felt. Um, I don't know. It felt different. It felt really oh confined and there's deserted no tree. island <laughs> in a way <laughs> deserted and from nature go, yeah yeah i mean i think even like when i lived in Asheville or, or raleigh like there's still trees you know but this place mm -hmm. there was no trees there's it was just concrete and an ag field and it was just really uh, i didn't realize how much it affected my psyche till we moved to a place with a tree in the yard and like squirrels yeah. and birds and you can hear nature and i was just like could breathe again you know it, it really makes a difference. When I gr I grew up in New York, and the the front the houses facing the front of all the houses on the block, there weren't any trees on our block. It was like just aluminum siding row houses, and mm -hmm. but in the backyard, everyone had a backyard, and you and they all butted up against each other, so you can see all the way down like to the i think almost to the water like huh. everyone's backyards and it was green it was completely green and overgrown it was so cool so even in that city and the uh, it seems like on that looking just on the surface that's just concrete jungle just terrible mm -hmm. but in the backyard it was really everybody green. wants their little pocket of nature i think it's important Mm -hmm. Even if you can just have a little, a little pot of something, but yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate not to have to live in an area where there's absolutely no nature, or very little nature, mm -hmm. but I know that there are a lot of people that do. I think it's a human need, just like, 
I mean, it should be a human right. I think it is a human right to, to have access to nature like that. So that brings us to um, our next question. So you grew up in Western North Carolina where water is plentiful and the landscape is lush and green, like we were just talking about, overgrown, temperate rainforest, a good majority of the year. And now you're located in California, which is a very different biome. Additionally, the general policies and cash flow and even some laws with regards to land management and conservation are quite different between the two places. So what has been some of your biggest culture shocks, both personally and professionally, going from working conservation settings here in the Southeast versus the opposite coast. Mm. I don't want to drag California too much. <laughs> Just a little. No. Come I, home. I, I love I do love this place, but I think that my I wasn't planning on talking about this, but you just reminded me that my biggest culture shock was learning that what water conservation means here is entirely different from what it means in North Carolina. So I was kind of the odd person out at the meetings where I didn't understand that basically what it means here. And I think that the tides are turning a little bit with um, the Sustainable Groundwater Act, but it means like conserving it, replenishing the basins, the aquifers, so that farmers can pump for groundwater extraction and for municipal uses. So water conservation just means like, how do we make sure that it gets back into the basin for human consumption? And it's just an entirely different way to think about water. Like it, it's, yeah. And I feel like in North Carolina, the focus for me in my, cause I've worked on rivers, like my professional life, most of it's been in like riparian systems. And in North Carolina, the focus was mostly on water quality because we, mm -hmm. we had enough that we could then focus on quality. There's very little talk about water quality here. And I think it's because wow. quantity is just such an issue. This is so scarce, yeah. And I, I view water differently. Like I think that effluent from um, from water treatment is a good thing for nature. I've never thought that in my life. <laughs> but here there's so little water that it's pockets of habitat that are actually like making oh. sure that migratory songbirds can survive on these uh, riparian systems. So um, yeah, it's just a very different way to view water. Um, but I would say that the other culture shock about California is it's a very ambitious driven place and it's not just people who work in my this is just my own personal observation it's not people who just work in Hollywood it's like every profession everyone's like hustling trying to get their name out there like doing everything they can to and it's it's mostly like I'm not saying this in a bad way I think it's good and it's actually like ramped up my my own life like it's made me work harder and like try to be better <laughs> it's really kind of cool but it's very pressurized like everyone's just you know out, out of curiosity do you feel like the general you know get, going kind of a little bit back to your your thesis work um do you find that the baseline of people in the general populace in california tend to be more aware or doing more uh in terms of climate and conservation, um, or even that the government and policies are, even if the lay people aren't compared to out here. Oh, yeah. I kind of thought that might be the case. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and I've learned so much that I want to spread around the country <laughs> by living here because there's so much good work happening. Um, the state politics here, I mean, well, it depends on who you ask whether it's good work happening, but state is, is uh, very democratic to the point that the differences among and I've heard heard this from people who work at the Capitol that the differences between Democrats is is getting nuanced because there's so many of them that it's about like individual personalities. So that's how our state politics are like it's so to the left that the only like division amongst them is just who likes who or you know i mean it's always kind of true about politics but it's it's just very um progressive and we also have something here called CEQA, which is um, california environmental quality act oh god i hope i got that right and it's the the state's version of what the feds do when you have like mm -hmm. a development project so the the federal 
version is NEPA. But California, I think, is the only state in the union. Actually, don't quote me on that. We should probably research that before I go off book. But um, I'm pretty sure it's the only state in the union that has its own um, um, environmental policies like that. And so what that means is it also creates a lot of business for environmentalists to come work out here because mm -hmm. you're having to constantly assess development projects for like its environmental impacts. Um, wow. So it's just a tool that conservationists have in their toolbox to to try to guide development towards better practices. So it's, just, it's such a progressive place. I mean, it's I can go on. It's such a good on baseline to have. Yeah. Although I will say, um, you know, it, it is what it is. Nothing you said was incorrect in terms of the, the, the politics, so to speak. But I will note that, you know, we, we tend to talk about and realize that left-leaning politics and, you know, Democrats, et cetera, are maybe going to put conservation and ecological concerns higher on the priority list as a rule, just historically speaking. But mm -hmm. it, you know, we can't keep thinking and talking like that. Like this, these are issues that are going to impact everyone, and the policy lines politically need to the the walls need to drop, yeah. and everybody has to get on board because. And it isn't it ironic that like. Uh, you know, conservatives, conservation, like there's, there's similar linguistics in the root, you know, so there, there's no reason why people of the, um, oh, yeah. of any other political persuasion shouldn't mm -hmm. be getting involved. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm kind of putting it out there for the, the overall listening audience that like the, you know, we're all inhabiting the same planet here, politics. Side, so. I totally agree. I mean, I, I just want to clarify, I do not think that climate change is a partisan issue or should be ever. It, it is not. Absolutely, it is not. And I think there's a lot of young Republicans that realize that. There's a growing movement of young Republicans who, who want that to not be a political or to not be based on party lines. But, uh, you know, my, my comments about Democrats, like, it also doesn't mean better environmental policy. Like you mentioned subsidizing um, oil and gas. I mean, there's there's been Democrats that are president that have done that. You know, it's yeah. it's yeah. not a given. So yeah, I mean, I think I take your points very well, yeah. Ellen, about that. Well, that's a good segue into this question. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty fair to say that people who work in a ecological conservation capacity are doing activist work in a sense, in some way. Uh, of course, not everybody's going to follow that avenue to a professional degree, but it's important, I think, that that all the lay people be informed and do the best that they can to support ecological health for the well-being of the planet. So from your vantage point um, and years of experience in different organizations and bioregions, et cetera, what do you think are some of the most useful or impactful things that the average person can do, you know, um, in terms of supporting the health of the planet, relating to climate, water cleanliness, sustainable living habits for humanity, et cetera. Um, I mean, I'll add the disclaimer that there's no one right answer. So nothing you hear is going to insinuate that it's the miracle be all save the world. Like, well, Kat said, this is the magic bullet, you know, like, but, but just in your experience, you know, like what are some observations you've made? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if this is going to be a very popular opinion, but the more I, this is, and, and it's also very arguable. So, I mean, if anyone has other points on this, I'm you know very open to hearing them, but currently my, my thinking on the climate crisis anyway, um, specifically is that it's going to be, it's going to require collective action more than individual action. And, you know, the truth has been coming out more and more that the plastics industry has been behind reduce, reuse, recycle, and um, the oil and gas industry has been behind championing individual carbon footprints. And these are things that put the onus back on the consumer and back on mm -hmm. the populace to say, it's your fault that we're living and drowning in plastic and that there's a climate crisis. No, it's not, it's their fault. And we were born into a world where we didn't control this outcome. Um, yeah. So, or, or, your, I, or your options are so limited, it's like, to do without in some cases for a lot of people mm -hmm. is like, it's a privilege to do without. Yeah. 
plastic, yeah. you know, like why, why that should not be my problem, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And it, it's not. And I, I'm really glad to hear that the message of climate activists is moving away from calculate your carbon footprint, reduce the amount that you fly. I mean, yes, those are good things, but that that's not what we should be fighting. That's not the fight that we fight. So, um, but as far as individual action, I think reducing your meat consumption and, and dairy consumption is like definitely so, a way that we can um, tell a tale with our wallets, you know, that's, that's a big story to tell. And I think that that's something that we can really do. Um, but what I will say, I think the other and thing I've learned- And you're speaking on that, just to clarify, you're speaking on that um, due to methane emissions and, or, I mean, I guess all of the above water quality, water. land use, et cetera. Yes, all of the above. I think it's funny, like people have asked me my whole life, why are you vegetarian? And I always want to turn the question back on them and have in some instances said, why do you eat meat? Like you have to justify yourself way more than I do <laughs> because, you know, it, there's so many reasons to not. I don't understand the reasons that you would other than it's a part of your culture and you've done it your whole life and you really like it. Those health situations. Things certain health situations might, but, but even then it can be minimal, you know, like compared to somebody who might eat like meat every meal of the day is like, okay, well, and I can, I, I can speak to that. Step at a time. <laughs> I can speak to that. Yeah. That's the reason that I had to stop being a vegetarian because of, I needed to be on something that was very low carb very i mean i don't i don't eat dairy i i, I have an, uh, a sensitive to dairy so um don't worry there but um yeah so that i guess we did that one reason where i had to go on to you know some meat mm -hmm. a little bit of meat and mostly vegetables instead of like beans and um but even still soy. it's not like you went out and you were like i'm no. gonna eat burgers mm -hmm. three times a day or whatever De definitely, yeah. definitely not. For and sure. It, and I, I didn't mean to step on a landmine oh, here. I mean, I do have friends that are on FODMAP and that's all they can eat. And I, you know, I understand. And diabetics, like, I think there's a lot of health conditions where that's your, your best and healthiest choice for sure. Oh well, um, yeah, I, but, I did. Sorry. I, I didn't think that. I just wanted to like okay. just mention, we were talking about reasons and I was like, well, let's, let's talk about like, this reason, because um, mm -hmm. I think it is a legit reason to, you know, because of health to, mm -hmm. to have, you know, and, and it was it was a hard transition and it's still kind of weird because my husband's vegetarian. So when I brought home that first like rotisserie chicken from like Whole Foods, he was just like, I thought you joined another religion. It was just really <laughs> weird. Like it was just very surreal moment um, and we use different pots and pans and we use different like um, sponges to wash our dish. We, have di we use different dishes and stuff like that. So it's, it was a, it's still, it's still bizarre, but, um, but yeah, that's, mm -hmm. but no, I was not, I was definitely not offended. And um, so. I know it's a, it's a weird and sort of tough, conversation because I also understand that similar to what Ellen said about it's a luxury to have to do without in some cases like you have to be more affluent to do without plastic and to, and to get an electric car and like all all these things it's kind of similar in eating meat like I think there's a lot of cultures that are that, that, that that's a part of the culture and you can't I, I can't deny that that's a powerful force, you know, or that it's just easier and more accessible, especially if you live in a food desert and all you have is a Carl's mm -hmm. Jr. down the road. You know, I'm not sitting here preaching to, to people that that's what they should do. But if if you're asking yourself, what's an individual action I can take, reducing that consumption, like yeah. I'm not going to have cheese every night of the week. I'm not going to have meat every night of the week, you know. But, you know, to segue to what I think is the most important thing people can do, it, not necessarily conservation wise, but at least climate crisis, if you're interested in getting involved is act locally. And I can guarantee you that anywhere you live in the US, there's gonna be a climate group. I don't know who they'd be affiliated with, but there's going to be some kind of climate group. And if it's not in your town, then the next town over and ask them what you can do because it's gonna take everybody doing everything. You know, if you're an artist who wants to paint something 
that you know tells a message about climate or you're a musician or you want to get into policy and you're a policy nerd you know like there's a place for everybody to do everything and it's so critical and i think that's where you can actually make change because your local politicians have to listen to you your state and federal people you know, okay, maybe one of their staffers will write back to you in a letter that's already been typed up. But like your local people have to listen to you when you show up and you force them to listen to you. And that's how change gets made. I really, really believe in that. So that's, I think the most impactful thing you can do as an individual. Show up, show up show on their up. doorstep. Show up, get involved. <laughs> Is that too broad? I mean, maybe I could give you some no, resources. No, 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 no. I, I, I think everybody, I mean, I knew what that meant. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think that a lot of people also. And I, I mean, I could give you some resources too if you have like a in the oh. YouTube or show notes. Yeah, we can like drop that. it in the, dis in the description. And yes. Get some links. Yeah. Yes, that would, that would be very helpful. Because I think... You know, when you say get involved, I think I know what that means and maybe what to Google, but other people might not. They're totally it new can be to hard this idea. Too. Yeah. I mean, I think it can, if you don't know the, the like names of the big, like there's 350.org, they have local chapters, there's Climate Reality Project. I think if you don't know those keywords, like, I mean, I found myself struggling, like, how do I get involved locally? What do I do? And like, just having to ask random people that I thought were working on this stuff. So any way that I can help like streamline that for folks, I'd give you guys nice. some names and yeah. stuff. That'd be awesome. Yeah. What would be the most amazing thing to you with regards to ecological conservation efforts? if humans manage to accomplish it within your lifetime, and do you think it is feasible in such a time frame? Oh my God. Do I have to just pick one? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's gotta be feasible. Well, hey, if you think a lot of it's feasible, then hey, that's awesome. <laughs> well, listen to you, you're the professional. <laughs> oh, I don't know if any of these are feasible, but I, I mean, I, I think, yeah. I think they are. The better angels of my nature will say that they are. <laughs> um, I think that we can reach um, 1.5 C or limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade because I think we're going to reach net zero by 2050. Um, I'll just put that out there as a hope mm. for the universe. <laughs> I mean, we're doing more than hoping. Everybody's working on it, but I that's my, my serious wouldn't this be amazing thing? Um, and then as far as conservation goes, I think saving mountain lions with wildlife crossings, um, mm. saving a uh, large megafauna from, from highways and interstates. I mean, I think that's something that we need to do all around the country. And I think California is really leading on that right now. Um, awesome. I think holding big oil and gas liable for climate change. I think that's something that we will hopefully see in our lifetimes. And I think it needs to happen. Um, and then I think there's some other cool things like um, granting personhood under the law to environmental bodies like bodies of water. I think that would, that would be nice. I mean, hell, if a corporation can be deemed a person, why not a body of water? It's more living, arguably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely doesn't come from me. That's other activists in this space working on that, um, especially indigenous uh, folks and speaking Hi. of indigenous folks, I think ceding territory back to sovereign nations is something that we will hopefully see more of. I think that there's more movement on that, and I think that's that's a. Um, yeah. I don't know how it would happen, but I, I hope to see that in our lifetimes. Um, and I think that is conservation. I think that can be a conservation win because I, I think that unless we take care of people we can't take care of land and a lot of people in this country are really hurting and how can yeah. we expect them to care about something that you know unless we're investing in them so well, yeah. so, well said also it takes the same thing to care about it's it's from the same mindset it's from the same ideas it takes the same it's just almost the same thought to take care of how you take care of land you take care of people and vice versa. So if you learn how to do one, 
you mm -hmm. can do the other, especially if you're tr treating a lake like a person. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's got to be all or nothing, all con all connected. And they both come from places of love and abundance instead of scarcity and fear. And I think that's what we need to harbor within ourselves to get through the next 50 years of <laughs> climate chaos. Um, <laughs> But it, but but in a in a grounded, realistic, roll your boot, roll your pants up, get to work sort of way, not just in a thoughts and prayers sort of way, not just love and abundance while the water is rising, you know. <laughs> Very true. But also have way. to do the work. <laughs> so many nonprofit jobs and science-based jobs conservation, environmental, et cetera, uh, tend to have a burnout rate because they require so much of their employees, as we've been talking about, you know, facing sometimes insurmountable cultural, industrial, political, ecological hurdles with sometimes slow coming reward for the efforts, if at all. And I'm sure there's been some times that you felt like you were maybe in a thankless job. So what inspires you and keeps you motivated? What are some accomplishments that you've achieved that, that keep you on your path. And just because um, it's important, what kinds of things do you do for you as far as self-care to combat burnout? That's a good question. I mean, I think the, the burnout is so real. And I think that environmentalists also experience compassion fatigue in a way. I think that's the right terminology. They use that mostly for like social workers, but I think when you're working in the in during a sixth mass extinction, there's no way around that. You know, I've I've seen um, colleagues of mine who wanted to go on a career uh, research track and turn toward. It's what I did. You you move away from research into a field of action because you feel hopeless and like you need to just feel like you're doing something instead of just navel gazing and writing papers that no one's going to read. <laughs> That's probably not a very popular opinion among. Um, a lot of scientists, but that's just kind of where I think a lot of conservationists heads are at right now is to feel actionable. And that's definitely what makes me wake up every day is doing something, just doing something, doing something, working with other people towards something you believe in. Um, even if it's small, like, you know, my, my climate group, we call our planning commissioners and we call our city council and we go to these meetings and even just that action of like, speaking about climate change at a city council meeting f gives me uh, something, some kind of hope and endurance that I'm doing something that's worth anything. You can, you, know? say, you can say, well, I did something. I, it, yeah. At least you can say you tried. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I function. Everybody's different. You know, we all have different ways that we cope, but I think feeling actionable is really just kind of the, the thing that, keeps me going and I don't really like to to even talk about climate change that much honestly because I think I've like done a lot of the grieving I've done a lot of that emotional mm -hmm. work and I'm ready to just kind of get to work instead of just processing it mm -hmm. um, but I think as far as like wins go um, you know they're there when you look for them like we we did um, at work we're doing a lot of research on migratory songbirds and we've recently found out that our restoration work where we're restoring these sections of river are really bolstering these populations of endangered oh, wow. songbirds and nice. that you know the data every year is really depressing because the numbers are dwindling diversity is going down um but the the data from this last year was like look what we're doing is working you know maybe it won't be fast enough maybe there won't be enough but it's enough to like bolster us and actually help our grant applications and be like now we feel determined to know that we're doing the right thing and that's the kind of stuff that you know unless you're doing the science and actually like looking into the truth of the world you won't know if what you're doing has an impact so um i think yeah digging in and seeing if you're having an impact is is a good thing what was the other part of your question so burnout. what do you do for you like as far as self-care to combat burnout um, I've been meditating every morning or not every morning. I try to every morning <laughs> and it really helps with not so much burnout as it helps with focus and concentration. Cause I similarly, um, Jennifer struggle sometimes with 
focus and concentration and like train of thought and just 10 or 15 minutes in the morning, it's almost like I've taken like an ADHD pill or something. Like I swear, it just like helps me get through the day of work and like, um, but I think also just spending time in nature, like it's super restorative. And I um, just went on a hike the other day where I, we're in a drought again in California. And so I, I've been anticipating having a poor wildflower year, which makes me really kind of sad. But I went on this hike where it was like crazy. I mean, it, they were all competing for my attention. All the wildflowers, yeah. the butterflies, everything was out. And I'm like, how are you living in this environment? But it, it just gave me this like, just rejuvenated me for the week to like have that experience nice to kind of nature going look we, we got here. this <laughs> it's stronger than you think sometimes you know i I've, I've heard some conversations starting to be had which i think is an interesting angle on all of this in terms of climate and conservation the discussion might be better served to not think so much about how can we self-important humans save the planet and more about like it's not the planet that needs saving in a sense like if we all disappeared tomorrow it would go on pretty well you know until the sun died you know Mm -hmm. so so the conversation's more about how do we keep things going in a way that we can exist in any capacity that we want that we want to Mm -hmm. um and and that's you know it's hard because you don't want to just make it a a selfish and species centered thought but sometimes i found it um comforting in a way to think about it that way where it's like oh you know what ha the earth is fine (laughs) like Mm -hmm. it's okay it's the people that that mm-hmm. need a little help reorienting, you know. To the- but in order to make it habitable for us, it needs to be, nature needs to be in the, in the balance that it's been in during yeah. human history. So, like, we yeah. still rely on the, the, the web of connectedness. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I totally agree. Like, that's a comforting thought for me, too, of, like, when I think about geologic time. I'm like, you know, we are nothing. We are a a speck, we are a crumb. (laughs) (laughs) And that's really comforting to me in a way of like, we just matter so little. Um, But I mean, yeah, we got to keep this dang thing going so that we can keep living. And I think there's nothing wrong about being species centric because it's it's natural to be that way, but also it's kind of the way that we're going to get more people into the fold to work on solutions. If you're like, mm-hmm. this affects you, it affects everyone. Do you want to live in a place that's it's charred by wildfire end. every year? Yeah. <laughs> or less charred by wildfire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, they, serve a, they serve a function. I, 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 you know, but I know it's, it's been getting worse and worse we're out of balance yes out of balance and that connection is just very frayed very broken Mm -hmm. and i just feel like people are living a lot of times apart like like i work full time and we're doing a lot of overtime and i work in a place without windows and so like a lot of times the only time i'm seeing the outside because i've been so tired that i've been inside before work i don't have time to go out or energy to go out and i work at night i work kind of second shift almost but very late Mm -hmm. and the only time i see the nature is out the window and on my way to the car Mm -hmm. and in the other times i'm functioning in this very human built environment this bubble thing this very encased and you'll be like it's very easy to think well i don't uh, what's nature i don't need nature i don't Mm -hmm. you know it just it feels very separate very removed and i think that it's it's easy to I totally lose that know connection. What you mean. 
easy to think that you're not a part, easy to disregard, even to think that you have to do something to help what's going on. It just mm-hmm. like it doesn't seem like there's a, a problem in a way. Yeah. No, no, I totally, totally know what you mean. And that, it, we, I know this wasn't necessarily one of the things we were going to talk about, but I, I think that connecting people to nature is probably one of the most important things we can do, especially as conservationists and biologists, because of what you just said, that you, you don't even know what you're missing because you don't have it. And then when you have it, you're like, oh, I feel relaxed. I feel happier. I feel lighter in my step because I'm going on a walk and the sun's out. And it, it does have physiological impacts on our mental well-being um, nice. and physical health. And it's, you know, you don't even know, like people where I live don't know that all the songbirds are declining because they hear them chirping out their windows. So they think everything's fine. You, you don't know until you know, and if no one has access to that knowledge and that space to learn, then no one will ever care. I mean, I, I catch myself sometimes feeling like everything's fine, <laughs> even though I'm probably the more educated on the topic than most people I know. And it's a trick um, because we live in this human built space where everything's our comforts are taken care of. And um, yeah, I think it's a serious problem that we need to remedy. And that's one thing I'm really happy to work on in my job is public access to nature. Very important. And, and I, I mean, for me, like I, I definitely know that, that when I don't get to go out and, and at least like maybe walk, I get incredibly upset. And I'm just like, that is important. And you're making me work overtime. <laughs> and I don't like that. It's the structure. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like, mm-hmm. it's not only like the building that I work in, it's the actual structure of the work. It's the structure of how we work. It's the structure of how we live. And mm-hmm. I, I'm sorry if I've gone on on a little tangent. It's but, not natural. Yeah. It's not normal. And we shouldn't be, I mean, he, we're not made for a nine to five or a second shift or you a know, third this, shift life. This is just sort of a little weird uh, thought that just popped into my head, connecting the dots, if you will. I have no proof if this is true or not, but it's an interesting thought, right? There's this dilemma right now of so many places talking about how they can't seem to hire enough people like there, like there's a lot of jobs out there available right now um and there's you know debate about like why aren't people working and i just was thinking you know there, there's that that's a there's a lot of arguments in that we're not going to unpack <laughs> but i was just thinking about how last year because of the pandemic so many people um took to doing things outdoors because it was one of the few things they could do so, you know, they, they, they pulled out those hiking boots from the back of their closet. They learned how to kayak. They, you know, started taking a walk every day because it was the only way they could get out of their house on a lockdown or whatever the case is. So it's almost like the situation um, created more outside time for people than they might have otherwise had. And wouldn't it be interesting if someone was able to correlate the possibility that what we're seeing now is people are, I don't really want to go work 40 hours a week closed in a building because all last year I got to do this stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. like, like that, that could be influencing things, you know, even on, even if it's, you know, on a subliminal level. I mean, Mm -hmm. that was, that was my, sorry, that was my experience because I lost my, my, job to the pandemic so i was out of work for like five six months and and i and i i do run every day and so i was running outside by a park that was closed and there was nobody there and i was just like man so awesome it's so quiet it's wonderful and now it's jam-packed with people they're people everywhere there and you know of course i took on this job for monetary reasons because i you know uh, unemployment was running out but i'm like man that was nice 
<laughs> so when I go and do more of that, it's it's really nice, like what Ellen was saying, that they got a chance to see a different way to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important. The seed important. has been planted. <laughs> I had a time in undergrad where I lived outside because I was doing research on this river on the Chioa river. And I lived outside for like weeks at a time. And I know it's not something that a lot of people can relate to, but I learned something in doing that, that I don't think a lot of people get to experience is that I, and I get why there's a lot of reasons why a lot of people don't like camping. So I'm not saying that you should like camping because I get why a lot of pe people don't, but it, it made me, feel more human is like the only way I can explain it. I felt more um, just mentally, like more stable, a lot better. And my sleep was natural. So I'd go to sleep when the sun would go down and wake up when it would come up and there'd be no difficulty in getting up. You know, it wasn't like snoozing the alarm and that, that has never been true of my life any other time. <laughs> so I just felt like better all around better. And it made me like glimpse that window of like, this is what I think, is wrong with, the, we're, we're ill as a society, we're sick because we don't live the way that our ancestors have lived for, you know, nearly a million history. years. Yeah, we haven't adapted yet to this strange way that we're making our bodies and minds live and it's it's not natural. Maybe Total tangent, but. Maybe we shouldn't adapt or we need to bring a little more of that back, but I, I, find the happy I, medium. Yeah, mm -hmm. un unfortunately, I think that it's not very oh. that and profits don't kind of align. Maybe it's not like, hey, maybe you didn't build my warehouse with like skylights for a reason because it would cost more money. Mm -hmm. But it would have mm -hmm. benefited the workers having mm -hmm. that sort of more natural light mm -hmm. coming into the building um, mm -hmm. and. Stuff like that. Maybe, maybe if there's if there's um, you know rules and laws getting set into place that that determine um, how sustainable development projects are, maybe we could hope in the future there would also be uh, considerations put in for the mental and emotional health of humans. Uh, you know, connection to nature in that same. So it's like okay, we're evaluating like you know, the source of the materials going into this building and the impacts they had on the environment to build here and so on and so forth. But also we're going to evaluate the natural daylight and the, the um, you know, the airflow and the, you know, I don't know, whatever else that you could possibly infuse natural into the indoor work environment. Get involved in state politics and you can <laughs> influence the building standards that North Carolina sets. You really can. I mean, if you write those kinds of comments and you show up to those meetings, those, that's the kind of stuff that they put in those codes and you can really impact change. And you're learning firsthand, Jennifer, like what you want to change about the world by having experiences that are negative. <laughs> and I think yeah. that, that is like the most important thing we can do because otherwise you don't know what those problems are, you know? It's it's or true. I mean, for politics. So we like to talk about books a lot. And what are some of the most inspirational and or informational books you've read and would recommend with regards to nature related themes and or mankind's relationship to and within nature? Hmm. Okay. I got a pretty good list. I think for this crowd, for you guys, one of the best books that I've read about what we're just talking about, access to nature, parks, impacts on well-being, um, is this book called Rambunctious Garden. Such a good book. And it really shaped the way that I think about these topics. Um, so I think that's a good one. And then for North Carolina, um, for nature enthusiasts, you know, there's a lot of like floras and field guides and there's so many of them and a lot of them are great. But my favorite one is by um, the author named Spira. Um, and it, because it, it does like a natural history kind of vibe where like you really learn oh, about cool. the communities and the habitats and, you know, the way that plants grow together. And like, so it's a field guide, but it's more like, um, tells more of a story. 
Is it North Carolina specific or just more like Southeast? Yeah. The name of the author is S-P-I-R-A, Spira. It's called Wildflowers and Plant Communities of Southern Appalachian Mountains and Piedmont. It's a naturalist's guide. My favorite book, and I don't know why I can't find it, um, which is concerning to me, but yeah, it's such a good read. I guess uh, Jennifer will be throwing those links into the description as well. I, I will be, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And the and the first one you mentioned, Kat, Rambunctious Garden. Rambunctious Garden, yeah. Who is that by, do you know? Um, I can tell you. So this is, um, this is the first book. It's on the screen, Wildflowers and Plant Communities of the Southern Appalachian Mountains, Piedmont, Naturalist Guide to Carolinas, Virginia, Tennessee, and Georgia. That seems awesome. And Rambunctious Garden is by Emma Maris. And then I also recommend um, if you are interested in science, history, and um, I guess also kind of like poetry and romanticism, <laughs> I would read Aldo Leopold. He's oh, um, one of the yeah. one of the fathers of conservation. Um, he's yeah. he's one of the first to start like describing the transformation mm -hmm. of prairies in the West and the loss of loss of native grasslands. But he does it in such a beautiful like he has a love affair with nature and it comes through in the way he writes. And he's just been an inspiration to me. Um, I don't have a specific mm -hmm. book, but just anything by Aldo Leopold. Um, I think you I've read San. Yeah, it's A L D O. Uh, I think L E A P O P O L D, maybe. Yeah, he kind of falls into that a little bit with like um, uh, the 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 poetic naturalists like um, uh, Henry David Thoreau and Goeth and Weth. I think that's how it's pronounced. <laughs> um, and. Uh, yeah. Okay, that is his. There we go. John Muir esque type writer Muir, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have done some lino print artwork as a hobby that you took up for some creative expression, and I believe kind of also as a healthy outlet, um, combating burnout. And you've been working on a series for a while now of the chakra mandala symbols overlaid with images of various endangered species. And you always write something really poetic um, to accompany each piece. So what inspired you to do a particular series like that, uh, you know, as an undertaking? And can you share a couple um, examples of what you've done with us? Just you can describe it for the listening audience and then those watching on YouTube will be able to see the image on the screen. Um, and then maybe share the words of reflection that you wrote to accompany the ones that you're going to share with us. Sure. Um, I guess my inspiration for the series was thinking about the chakras. It's like connecting um, back to yourself, right? Like grounding each part of yourself and being a whole person. And I guess the theme of what we've been talking about has been connection to nature. And that's kind of the whole point of it is we've lost touch with nature and that is why we're in an extinction crisis. You know, that's kind of like the main thesis of the pieces. Um, and so uh, each, you know, I pick the animal or the, the sort of group to focus on based on the chakra. So if like there's a chakra that, you know, focuses on water elemental and I'll think about, well, what is an endangered, you know, aquatic species or habitat that I want to highlight? Um, so that that's kind of like the main reason behind it. And then lino, I just, I've always loved linoleum block printing. I've always loved block printing in general, like Japanese block prints. And so my partner just one day surprised me with a like intro to lino kit. And I just like loved it so much. It's so fun. I mean, it's like the most meditative, relaxing thing is you're just like carving out little 
bits of linoleum for hours at a time, <laughs> which sounds, but it's like doing a puzzle, you know, the same kind of like mindset, I think. So it's really meditative. Revealing. But yeah, I'd love to read one if you want. Do you have uh, the prints with you there? Uh, oh, did you want me to like hold them up or are you going to put photos up or? You could, you could send photos for Jennifer to put up, but if you have them to hold up, I guess that'd be. I don't have them available. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so tell us, tell us uh, which one or two you're going to um, share and then she, you can send the photos later. Sure. Um, yeah. I'll share two of them. I can share the, the sacral chakra because um, I was just talking about water, so it's a good segue. Um, do you want me to read the what I wrote about it? or? Yeah, so what, what was the uh, species yeah. or habitat that you attached to it? It's giant California kelp forests. Um, they're on the decline because of climate change, um, habitat loss, and um, um, urchins. So the, the habitats become imbalanced and now sea urchins are eating all the giant kelp, whereas the sea urchins used to be kept in check by other predators that are now hurting. Um, so California kelp forests are dying and, you know, an equivalent would be maybe like a chestnut forest dying. You know, it's a forest, it's a habitat. And so it's not just a species, it's a whole trophic chain of decline that's happening. Um, and my organization and several others are really working on trying to combat this and, and research the heck out of it. And that was kind of my inspiration is everywhere I turned at work, people were talking about kelp. So it was very front of mind. So what was your reflection on the kelp? You want me to read this? Um, mm -hmm. The sacral connects us to our passion, creativity, and emotions, the pillars for cultivating empathy and compassion for worlds outside our own. The element affiliated with the sacral chakra is water, which is fitting as perhaps there's no world more foreign to our own than the sea. I find myself limited by my understanding and my biology to fully experience the magic of the deep, but one glimpse is enough to incite some wonder. I've felt the cool, strong embrace of the kelp blades as they slowly dance around my arms, and have come to at least appreciate the quiet majesty of these watery forests. At one time, these forests weren't so quiet and calm to our aquatic doppelgangers. They were frantic with activity as the kelp blades sheltered and fed a diverse cast of characters, each carving out their niche in a beautifully complex trophic chain. A helpful comparison may be the rainforest with its multitudinous vertical and horizontal habitat. Each species of bacteria, insect, plant, and mammal rehearsing its part in the dance of coevolution. The dance is intricate and balanced on a knife's edge. A few links in the chain break, or perhaps even one, and you get cascade failure. Perhaps an even more approachable comparison can be made with our own North American forests. The deer are to the herbs and shrubs of North American forests what sea urchins are to the California kelp forests, an unregulated entrepreneur. The mechanisms for policing these behaviors no longer exist as the links in the chain drop to the bottom of the sea and forest floor. At this time, I'm convinced that emotional connection is the key to conservation. Whether through story, symbol, or the food on your plate, it's only real for you when it's real for you. It can be hard to form a connection when there's a barrier to exploration as great as oxygen, but maybe the chirality of our two worlds can help shrink the spaces in our minds in which they occupy. After all, we're made of the same things, water and carbon. <laughs> Beautiful. I love kelp. <laughs> the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's so tasty too. <laughs> it's so nutritious. Gotta save those forests. By, by eating them? No. <laughs> well, we gotta get the urchins. Hey, oh, if you, you want to okay. do something to help okay. the, okay. If you yes. want to do something to help the California kelp, you can start eating yeah. uni. No thanks. <laughs> but if you're into it, you can do it. <laughs> well, may, uh, hopefully, some if someone really likes it, then that's what they can do to to help with, yeah. with the environment. That that could be their their contribution. Yeah, that's a good I think, point. I think I'll also pass. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you had a, a second one? Yeah, if you'll indulge me. Yeah, 
Um, I'd like to show the, the one I did about the green salamander because it's my favorite print. Um, and this is about the third eye chakra. The third eye is strengthened through the act of meditation and with enough practice can connect us with our intuition and insight. Sometimes we're meditating and practicing mindfulness without conscious awareness, acts that induce what psychologists call flow. They seem to be like the purest forms of mindfulness to be so intensely engaged in an activity that you don't even recognize your level of engagement. Minutes turn to hours and there you are without eating a square meal for a full 24, but the afterglow of flow is worth the pang of hunger and the body aches. I experience some combination of attention deficit and flow when I'm out in nature searching. It could be for apple galls, rare orchids, fossils, or salamanders. Whatever the mission is for the day, I'm enraptured. The only thing that can throw me off the scent is another beautiful discovery. I've come away from time in the field bruised and bloodied and only noticed hours or days later. Having a mission and a sense of exploration are the greatest feelings in life. While I never found a green salamander, the search was well worth it. I logged many hours hanging on the edge of a granite boulder, shining flashlights into crevices, hoping for a glimpse of this rare green beauty. The salamander's namesake is one of its unique characteristics, as few other salamanders have bright green coloring. The chaotic green splotches seem to imitate the mossy and lichen-colored rocks where their species calls home. The hyperspecificity of habitat, such as the green salamander's cliff face crevice, is one reason for its decline. The fewer suitable habitats available, the more pronounced their loss will be on the population. U.S. Fish and Wildlife fact sheets have become all too predictable. Habitat loss and degradation are the primary threat to the species. Habitat loss is such a common cause for decline for so many species that fish and wildlife must be increasingly selective about which species get a federally protected status. Salamanders pose an extra challenge when it comes to protection as they readily speciate due to their small home ranges and geographic genetic isolation. Many green salamander populations in its range look identical, but on a genetic level, they're a different species entirely. The rules of nature don't bend to suit our nice rules of bureaucracy. The system does work sometimes. I've seen species come back from the brink of extinction because of concerted efforts by federal and state governments and many organizations, scientists, volunteers, and companies that all do their part to monitor and protect populations. I have tremendous respect for the men and women working at the Fish and Wildlife Service as it's not easy or politically popular work. Although my time searching for the elusive cells was exciting and fun, to glimpse one is the real prize. I hope selfishly that they may someday be easier to find. Thanks. Me too. Yeah, it'd be so cool. You should post pictures of them or something on this podcast because they're so beautiful. Green salamander, be on the lookout. Well, I you probably won't find one, but you could try. <laughs> hey, it'll be like a, a hunt to get people engaged with nature. <laughs> no, be Please don't hunt the them. Cliff faces. No, I, well, well. <laughs> Hunt only in the looking sense. Hide and seek. Yeah. Scavenger yeah. hunt. I think it's the more important part, honestly, than the photos. I mean, I'm a beginner. I don't pretend to say that I'm an artist at all. I don't really, like, know what I'm doing. And but If you do the stuff, then you're an artist. The art is in the act. Yeah, you're right. That's that uh, imposter syndrome coming out. <laughs> That's right. Because in this day and age, you know, so many people are just like, you know, oh, well, there's 50 bajillion people on the internet who've done it better than me and made a bunch of money, so why should I? It's like, that because that's not the point of doing it, of dancing or singing or doing any kind of creative mm -hmm. outlet, you know? It's, it's for you or it's a, a giving back in some way. And I think that yours is very much a giving back, which is awesome. Yeah, I've had you. some people ask me for prints, and I'll just say donate to a charity or a nonprofit that's working on that species recovery, and that makes me feel a little better. You know, I'm not trying to monetize or like have some kind of presence or anything. It's just about the act of creation. Yeah. Thanks for letting me share that. Yeah, you're Thank welcome. Thank you. It's very fitting. Very fitting for the theme of the show. And if you're watching on our YouTube channel, you'll be able to see this. Prince. And um, if you're listening, you'll have to go and watch on the YouTube channel to be able to see those prints. <laughs> so. <laughs>
Well, I think we have come to the end. Time to, to wrap up today. Um, I'd really like to thank everyone for listening. And I want to thank Kat for joining us and having this wonderful discussion. It's really good to thank meet you. you. You too. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. Yes. And it's been really, we've had, it's been nice to talk about science. I think that's been, that's been really great. It's something that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet on this show, this science angle. And, and I love, I'm a, I'm a big nature, like, I don't know, nerd. Like I like to watch the, I grew up na watching the nature documentaries and stuff like yeah. that. So it's, uh, and then, you know, David Attenborough and everything. And it's been really cool talking to someone who, who, who deals with um, science and all that stuff on a, on a regular basis and does that type of work. Okay, so we will put in the description links to the books and links to some local North Carolina climate action groups and also some national websites to look at where you can go and find groups to volunteer with. And then um, also, Kat, you have a local group that you are working with or did you helped font font you helped to font oh my gosh you helped to find I'm gonna give up. I'm gonna give up. I'm gonna give up. A co founder co -founder. of co founder maybe <laughs> oh man That's um, I, and we will put that link up if anyone is in California or if anyone just wants to check out your group and see what you guys do inspired yeah. yes exactly um and you can follow us we are on anchor we are also on spotify so if you want to listen to us we are on instagram we have a facebook group if you'd like to join and we are on youtube so all those links will be in the description if you would like to support us please go to our anchor page and click the support button you can donate you can support us at $1, $5, or $10 a month, and that um, goes to us once we all get vaccinated and everything, and COVID, uh, hopefully things open up a little bit, we can go traveling, and that money will be very helpful in- Take the show on the road. Yes, in allowing us to do that. Join us uh, the next episode. I will be sharing a review of the book Women Who Run With Wolves, Myths and Stories of the Wild Woman Archetype by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. And our new episodes, they drop on the second, third, and fourth Wednesdays of each month. So please, please join us. And um, yeah, I hope everyone has a good week and we will, we will talk to you, see you chat with you next time. So. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.